a special time, and if you're visiting, um, I'd like to encourage you to, to hang around and, and ask questions about what we do up here, what we say, um, and because I think that you're watching a church body function as a body this morning, and, and it's so good to see that and be a part of it. It's truly humbling. Um, I'm going to be looking at uh, Joshua chapter 1 briefly. Uh, while you're turning there, I'd like to offer up a couple of, of uh, thank yous. Um, first to David. Uh, we've talked about this as th this group of guys, and um, we're thankful for, for David. In the very beginning, uh, when the former elder stepped down, uh, David was quick to grab uh, all the men that were available and willing and um, set a, a very important um, precedent, and that was to uh, establish just the much-needed leadership to continue going on that has led to this moment this morning. So, David, thank you for that. Um, thank you for your, your dedication and the insight that you, um, you took that, that time. The second is Dennis. Um, I'm so thankful for you, Dennis, personally. Um, and I know all these guys are, too. And um, he has sacrificed a whole lot for this church and continues to do that. So I just we want to lift up uh, just Thanksgiving to you, Dennis, for that. And I don't mean to embarrass you, but I was definitely not going to tell you we were doing this before. So, but thank you. Um, so... Joshua is a very, um, it's a very awesome uh, book of the Bible to, um, to talk about leadership, for one, and, and not just leadership, but as you're going to see in just a minute, also uh, being a part of the congregation that, um, the, that leadership is a leader over, if that makes any sense. Um, I want to read from uh, verses 10 through 18, if you'll read with me. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you saying, the Lord your God, is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you <clears throat> beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them. Until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has, has to you, and they also took, uh, take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it. The land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the, uh, toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you <clears throat> as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So this is a powerful picture of an obedient, active leadership leading an obedient, active, and willing group of people. And after this interaction, if you read the rest of uh, Joshua, um, land was conquered, walls fell, and even the sun stood still. There was success and power in their working together. So I just want to tell you, and you'll hear from each of us, there's going to be a common theme but there, this will be an obedient and active leadership that we're establishing today, and we will encourage commitment and action among you. And so just as Joshua said to um, the Israelites, um, prepare yourselves. Prepare yourselves here at Central spiritually. Prepare your families for commitment and service as, as we have prepared ours. We have done the same thing. We're not asking anything from this congregation that we haven't started ourselves already. And one thing that we ask as well, that Joshua, I'm sure, took comfort in from the prayers from Israel, was from verse 17 of chapter 1, only may the Lord be with you as he was with Moses. We ask that you would pray that for us as well. Good morning, church. 
that's comforting to hear that every time, that, that response from y'all. Uh, similar to what Chris was talking about, I'm, I'm going to be discussing a little bit about the commitment from you. Not necessarily just to us, but to, also, but to this church, this congregation, and, and your commitment as a Christian. Um, as, as we've been meeting over the past few weeks, uh, one of the common themes that has been coming out from, uh, from our discussions, and I think this has come from each of us, is kind of how we want our eldership to proceed. You know, we don't necessarily want it to get bogged down into micromanaging how the various works are going on here. Uh, we, we really don't want to get bogged down into uh, financial details, although that's, both of those may be part of it. Um, but we do want to concentrate on being shepherds, on being the spiritual leaders for this congregation. Um, if you will, turn with me to Acts chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading the first four verses of that chapter. It says, now in those days when the disciples were growing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Greek-speaking Jews against the native Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called the whole group of the disciples together and said, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God to wait on tables, but carefully select from among you brothers seven men who are well attested, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this necessary task but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So obviously this is the institution of the deacons, uh, the first instance of that. And in this particular case, they were put over serving of food, but really they were put over the works of the church at that point in time uh, to, to tend to the physical needs of the church. And as, as the men started meeting I believe it was last November. Uh, you know that was one of the things that came up as, as a need was how do we ensure that the physical works of this church continue? Uh, and, and one of the first things we did was was talk to the deacons and make sure that they were willing to continue to serve in their their roles at that time. Um, but also there were some needs that deacons weren't meeting at that time and, and one of the first of those was just watching over the budget. Uh, so we created a, a committee. Uh, finance committee was the first one um, and then the education committee was another one that was created. There were other committees created but the point was that was a way that the group of men uh, decided to meet the needs, the physical needs of this church at that time and it was a huge success. I mean, we, we've really felt that, the, that having these committees allowed more people to get involved. It allowed more people input into the say of how the, the physical work, would, excuse me, was going on. And, and that's something that we want to encourage. Uh, we, we want people to continue to be involved in that. Um, and, and try to get as many people involved in the, in the ongoing work as possible because an active church is also a growing church. Uh, so I guess our plans over the coming weeks and months are, again, meet with the deacons, make sure they're willing to continue to serve. Um, you know, being a deacon is not a lifetime appointment. You can step down if you need to um, or, or change areas if you need to. So we want to ensure that the current deacons are willing to continue and if they want to move to a different area, that, that we can accommodate that. We want to kind of formalize what all ministry areas that we do continue here at this church. Um, you know, obviously we, we've got a couple already, and, and maybe we combine some, maybe we add some more. Uh, but that'll be some discussions that we talk about over the coming months. And then finally, we want to talk about adding more deacons. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that the more deacons we can have, the better, and, and not just one per ministry, but maybe working in teams. Uh, 
I'll, I'll say from my own experience, the, uh, I've been a deacon at four different congregations now, and the best experience I had was when I worked with a team of other deacons. Uh, and not just deacons, but other, other me people that were involved in that ministry. And it, it just makes it so much easier on you. You're, you're, not, you're not on an island at that point in time. And, uh, and you have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of and, and somebody that can tell you no, too. Uh, so that, that's something that I would like to encourage each of you men that are eligible to be thinking about because that will be coming up here very soon. And then also for the rest of the congregation, be thinking about what ministry areas you want to serve in. Uh, we, we want you to, to be involved, to have your input, and to, be, uh, and, and to be active in our congregation. You know, we, we all remember the story of the parable of talents and how the master gave his talents out to his servants and he expected them to use those talents, right? And when he came back and, and uh, two of his servants had used those talents and increased them, he was happy with them. But the one servant that, that hid his talent, he, he, was, he was banished. So I encourage you, think of where you can use your talents here. But also don't be afraid to go into areas that you may not be comfortable with because you'll find those hidden talents sometime and find a passion for an area that you really weren't expecting. It, it worked that way for me at, at, at another area. I wasn't real fond of a particular area that elders put me into, but uh, it, it worked out well. Um, and, and as Chris said, you know, with your support, we can make this a, a successful, uh, growing congregation and, uh, and, and now that we are uh, back in, in the, the scriptural formation that God intended for us to be, uh, I, I see very happy things for this congregation in the future. I'm not stealing this. May I have one, David, just in case uh, for our lesson this morning? This is a very humbling experience, um, partially due to Emma telling me before I got up here, break a fever. I told her this was not theater. This is not an act. That does help, though. This morning we're talking about um, commitment and service. Um, in Matthew 20, 25 through 28, um, talks Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise, exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Um, one of the things to think about is in Jesus' kingdom operates different uh, set of standards than the world. Greatness is not found in position, Greatness is not found in exercise of power. Greatness is not found in being served, not found in commanding others, not found in wealth, not found in intellect, uh, but greatness is found in serving. Uh, if you're going to become greatest among Jesus' followers, you're going to have to serve, especially your own family. In John uh, 13, uh, 12 through 17. This is after Jesus had just washed the feet of his disciples. Uh, after Jesus washed their feet, he put on his clothes and sat down at the table again and asked them, do you know what I've just done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because I am the teacher and the Lord. And since I, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you ought to go wash in one another's feet. I've given you an example that you should do things for others as I've done for you. I'm telling the truth. A slave is not more important than his master. A messenger is not more important than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you'll be happy if you practice them. Um, some examples we learn from these areas is God blesses those who go counterculture uh, with no thought in going, getting, re excuse me, serving people in other, um, with no thought of what you're going to get in return. 
Um, Jesus was one who would initiate being a servant. When he saw a need needing done, he would just go ahead and do it. Um, and also, last week, um, service should be motivated by love, love for other people. And I think that's how we're going to help this church grow even more so, is just showing love for each other and those that are out there. You see in front of you four very imperfect people, um, but by the grace of God, we're here, um, and we're there. So if any of you are needing anything, feel free to call at any time, and I'll give you their numbers at any time you need it. Um, Acts 20, 35. In everything I did, Peter was saying, I showed you by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words of Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than receive. I've been standing in front of people in a ministerial role for the better part of four decades. This is a totally new experience for me, one that I do consider with the gravity that it brings to any situation, especially as it relates to who we are as people and of our ultimate destination. Through the years, I have been a participant in elders' meetings. I have listened to the things that they have said I have tried to understand some of the thinking that was a part of their leadership. For me, those meetings have been enlightening. They have been enjoyable. They certainly have been thought-provoking. And unfortunately, sometimes those meetings have been discouraging. For over 40 years, I have been in elders' meetings, not as an elder, obviously, but as a minister. And so this is a totally different experience for me, one that I do question whether or not I'm up to the task. I'm willing. I want to give it the effort, and I want it to be the very best effort that I can give. I can tell you what I'm not about. I am not about being an elder. I'm not. I am about being a shepherd. I want to know you. I want to be with you. I want to know what your thoughts are and what your feelings are. If there is something that is heavy on your heart, I want you to be free to share it and that we can pray together. I come with a strength. My strength's name is Barbara. She is a very dynamic woman, a very loving and caring woman, a very godly woman, and a woman that has been a fabulous wife and mother to our children. And I don't know that I could have accomplished half of the things that I've accomplished if it had not been for my wife. So when I say that I want to be a part of this family in a very special way as a shepherd, she will be attending with me. We want to come to your home and we want you to come to our home and some of you have already been in our home. We want to share meals together and we want to be together. We want to see what it's like to be a part of God's family, that we are his children. We are his sheep of his pasture and we need to act and to live in such a way that we recognize who the true leader is and that our ultimate authority is God's holy word. And we're going to go forward, and we're going to do things perhaps that have never been done in this congregation. And I'm not talking about unscriptural things. I'm talking about following intensely God's holy word. It is the map. It is the pathway. It is the guidebook. It is our compass. It is our direction. 
to go from where we are to where God wants us to be. We are his children. He passionately, desperately loves each and every one of us. And he wants us to be with him. And he paid a terrible price, a horrific price, that we can be in his holy presence. I have committed to you and to these men to serve as a shepherd. And I look at that from the standpoint of the shepherd boy, David. And that beautiful psalm that he wrote, the 23rd Psalm, recognized from the very outset and proclaimed it to the world and to us that we are the beneficiaries of what David said as he recognized, the Lord is my shepherd. And he stated immediately thereafter, I won't want. He fully supplies, he fully takes care of us. And that's what our ultimate goal and objective is all about. A thousand years later, the Apostle Paul said to the church in Ephesus and to the leaders there, Take heed to yourselves and to all of the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Acts 20 and 28. L let me give you that other part there. This is sort of the preacher part of me. That very ending there when he says, which he has purchased with his, his own blood. We talk about the unity of the, the Father and the Son and the Spirit. It's here in this verse. And he's talking to the shepherds of the flock. Paul says, listen, you have an awesome responsibility. These are God's children. These are his sheep. This is his flock. Feed them. Provide for them the spiritual food of life eternal. Because he purchased them with his own blood. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Feed the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That God purchased it with his own blood. Dearly beloved, those are powerful words. They are so powerful. I want you to consider with me as one of four our direction of going forward. I hope that it would not be because of the lack of foresight and vision on our part. I hope that we would reflect on the words of Hosea when he said, my people die because of a lack of knowledge. You must be a student of God's holy word. We will do everything that we can to encourage you in being in the word, not just reading it. It's wonderful that you would read through the Bible in the course of a year. God bless you if you do that. But what I'm talking about is you being a student of the word that you study the word. I don't care if you don't read but one chapter in a year. I'm not looking at quantity. Let's look at quality. Dig into God's word to see what he has to offer to us. I have seen people commit to things over which their heart was not in it. I have seen situations in which the fans in the stands were totally committed to their team winning. But the players on the field were not even motivated to do that. There is a difference between commitment and motivation. And I want to suggest to you that these two, commitment and motivation, are mutually exclusive. You may see some similarity in them, but boy, they're unique in their own way. And we're about a commitment and we're about being motivated with vision. I don't know where the church is going to be in a year. I don't know where Central will be in a year, but I want to know. And I want to know where Central is going to be in two years, and three years, and four years, and at least 
five years. And I'm going to suggest to these men that are behind me and to you that we need to have a five-year plan. We need to know where we're going. We need to look at Chattanooga in a totally different light. This community is changing right around us, before our very eyes. Are we in tune to what's going on in Chattanooga? We need to be. This can be a dynamic, powerful congregation in downtown Chattanooga. But it will not be if we do not have a vision, if we don't have a plan, and we don't know where we're going, I can guarantee you for certain we will not get there. It does require that we have a plan and we know where we're going. Critically important. I was asked to extend an invitation. And I've done that a lot of times. To my knowledge, the churches of Christ throughout the world have been one of the unique gathering groups of believers that when they come together, they conclude their assembly with an invitation. When we were in Africa, the brethren there concluded their sermons with an invitation. And for the past 2,000 years, from the very beginning, we've got scriptural ground on which we stand of extending an invitation. And how wonderful a thing it is that a person would come into our assembly and want to know, what must I do to be saved? Salvation is based on, as you heard me say a moment ago, the blood of the Lamb of God. The blood was shed. And so we extend an invitation it's not a ritual. We find the invitation being extended on the day of Pentecost. As Peter preached that powerful sermon and the people cried out after they'd heard it because they'd been cut to their heart. What shall we do? And Peter gave the invitation, repent and be baptized every one of you. So we stand on an invitation that is ancient we're talking about an invitation that's been going on for 2,000 years. That when God's people came together, the needs obviously are there. And so we extend an invitation. I don't know where you are spiritually. I know where you are right now physically, but you may not be here mentally. I hope you are. I hope you're tuned in to what I'm saying. Because it has eternal life ramifications. Where are you? Do you have a need? The invitation was extended, and it was extended by Peter, and it was extended by the Apostle Paul, and it has been extended throughout the millennia to people that have a special need, a spiritual need, to come to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you a child of the King? If you're not, you can be, but it will require... It does require an act of death. It does require death. And if you're not a child of the king and you've never confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, I can promise you this. We will give you a most fitting and appropriate burial. And almost instantaneously, as the death has taken place and the burial follows, we will see that you're resurrected, newborn in Christ Jesus. That's what they were doing 2,000 years ago. That was what Peter said to them. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. If you've never been born of the water and the Spirit, I can't hold out a whole lot of hope for you. I can pray for you and hope that you will see the light and that you will make changes. And if you're here today and you have confessed Jesus as, as Lord and as he died and was buried and was resurrected, you can die and be buried and resurrected. But you haven't followed that. You haven't lived it. And there are changes that need to be made in your life. You can let us know that and we will pray for you. We will help you to get going in the right direction. We'll do everything that we can to support you and to encourage you. And we would want you to do the same with all of the rest of us that are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to sing an invitation song. We hope that you will join in this song 
because it is a song of encouragement to someone that may very well need to hear the words and the meaning, what must I do to be saved? Would you come as we stand together and sing? Amen.